Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome, Bruchem Habayim. I hope this note finds you, this, uh, this broadcast finds you well. I hope everybody is healthy. Kedush Baruch should watch over all of us. Uh, special thanks once again to our terrific, fantastic office team. Huge shout out to our administrative assistant, Tracy Schultz, and our PR czar, Daniela Schwartz, for all of their work to make so many of these uh, happening this morning uh, and continuing on. Emir Tzashem, the Kolo will be resuming tomorrow our regular schedule of Shiurim for the Zman, and we're very excited to welcome everybody. Uh, we're going to start in just uh, one moment. Okay, I think we're ready to go. Revit, let's see if we can. Good morning, Revit, can you hear us? I can hear you, yes, can you okay, hear me? Okay, we can't see you yet. Can you tilt the screen down maybe a little bit because we don't see you so well? Oh, a little bit better, okay, much better. Thank you, Revit. So first of all, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. It's, it's an incredible schus to welcome um, such a, an incredible lineup of guests, and we are especially uh, grateful that Rebbe Rav Herschel Shechter, Mori Verabi Shalita is uh, taking some time to share with us this morning. Rebbe, maybe you want to tilt it just up a little bit because it's hard to see your eyes. It's oh, much better. Perfect, perfect. A uh, little further down. <laughs> well, oh, like that. Perfect. Okay. So, we want to just begin this morning uh, with a, a word of Hakara Satov on behalf of the whole community. I don't know if Rebbe realizes or fully appreciates what an impact the Piske Halacha and the Hadracha that Rebbe has been giving for all of Klal Yisrael and for the communities and for the Balabatim and for the Rabbanim over the past four weeks. I know that being a member of the RCA, I've been had have been privileged to see many of the Psakim that have been sent out and through YU, through REITs. And it has given us so much chizuk and so much uh, strength. And we really, really appreciate all the time that Rebbe has devoted to being machzik the tzibur so that we could be shomer uh, the halacha exactly kados in this very unusual circumstance. So we appreciate it so much. Thank you, Rebbe. Very good. Um, just by way of introduction, this week, uh, this past week was Chalamoid Pesach, was the yard site of Marana Rav Yosef Dov Halevi Soloveitchik. And we were we are excited. We were excited to welcome Rebbe to share a few reflections on Rab Soloveitchik. But this is in, the, in a greater context that I can reflect on personally, and that is the importance of each one of us, all those who are watching online and those who are listening. The importance of what the Mishnah tells in Perakei Avos of Asela Charav. It's important for each one of us not just to have a Rav, to have a posik, someone to answer halachic questions, but it's also important to have a Rebbe Asela Charav in the sense of having someone that we look to for inspiration. For many of us. That was a, a teacher that we had growing up, or a role model in Yiddishkeit, a parent or a grandparent, or for those people who are watching who didn't have such a person, now's a good time to find one, whether it's a person who's living or putting a, putting a pen to paper and identifying and maybe reading a storybook or doing some research. Each one of us to have a Rebbe and someone to connect to, to inspire us to grow and to, to push us further. I think that that's something that I have been privileged to have. Baruch Hashem, I have many Rabbeim and I've had many Rabbeim, but Rebbe, you're chief one among them, one of uh, the people who I go to and think about, you know, when I make decisions for the Kolo, it's something that I do collaboratively with many different people. But at the end of the day, we all, when we have a Rebbe, we think to ourselves, how would, how would Rav Shechter say, how would he think about this decision? What would Rebbe think? Would I be embarrassed to tell Rav Shechter that we were doing this and this? And the answer is yes. If I couldn't explain it, then we shouldn't be doing it. And that's something that each one of us, we need to think about, and we can develop those on, in different ways. Uh, we had the great privilege in our family, uh, Nechama and I, now it's been uh, over 16 years, Baruch Hashem, since we had Rebbe, who was the Masada Kedushan at our wedding. So this, this from, uh, from the annals of history, Rebbe will remember for sure, that it was a very unusual weekend because that Thursday night was the blackout in August of 2003. So this was... This was when I, I didn't look, 
like I do today. This was our, uh, and also for those who are not familiar, Rav Schechter is also dancing par excellence. If you can see there, Rebbe. So I still remember that day uh, very fondly, of course, on many levels. So Rebbe came to join us in Miami for the wedding. And, and since then, giving just uh, advice and chizuk and hadracha for, as, as my Rebbe since before we came to Chicago and continuously we have, I have so much hakar satov. And maybe Rebbe could take a few moments to reflect on his Rebbe, on Rav Yosef Dov Alevi Soloveitchik, whose yard site was this past week and what it means to have a Rebbe and how important that is for each one of us. Rav Soloveitchik had a beautiful drosha that he would say over every so often, um, if it, it was appropriate for the occasion. The drosha was on Parshas Kairach. He told us that he gave this drosha in Eretz Israel, I think, when he was in candidate for the chief rabbi in Tel Aviv in 1935. He visited Eretz Israel once. So uh, Rashi, in his commentary on Chumash, quotes from the Medrash, that Kairach came with a Talashikula Trelis, a garment that was dyed uh, at four corners. And a four corner garment is obligated, you have to put on tzitzis. And in the Chumash, it says you have to have white strings, long, and then you have to have some blue strings, Trelis in each corner. So the um, Medrash says that Kairach came with a, a beggar, a garment, a four corner garment that was all dyed Trelis, and he only wanted to put love in the corners. He said, if the whole garment is trailers, what do you have to put trailer strings in the corner for? And the dinner said, it's not correct. Moshe Abena said, it's not correct. You still have to put trailers. Rav Salvechik was wondering, what did he have against trailers? What did it bother him so much that you should put trailers? So he explained, part of this is based on a, uh, an idea that Rabbi Samson Rafael Fersha has in his forum, that the love one represents those things in life that, we, that are very clear that are, are understood. And he mentioned the Ravid will often disagree with the Rambam and they'll say, Lom Chuvar, it's not white. Chivra is white. Lom Chuvar means that it's not white. When it's white means that it's clear, we all understand it. And the Pasuk has an expression, Ufor Suha Simla, Le'eni Haskenim, by Moitzi Shemra, so the Gemara understands, Dvarim Chuvarim Kisimla, that in the days of Tanakh, most of the dresses did not have any color. That was unusual to make a, a woman's dress with a color on it. Big date see But normally uh, a dress would be white. So that's called the first similar dvarm chavarim kisim. And trailers is daimala kisi covered. Trailers represents the things that we really can't fathom, that we can't can't understand at all. So everyone in life, there are things that we do understand, and everyone has to recognize there are things that we don't understand. So Koirach's argument was everybody stood at Har Sinai. Rashi explains in his commentary on Chumash, why do you think that you have a, a monopoly? He tells Moshe Abena on Pascha and all the Shaz. We were all there at Har Sinai. Everybody can Pascha the Shailas. There's no area of Trelis that we don't know. Everything is Lovan. Everything is Lovan. Everybody can figure everything out on their own. And that's exactly what Moshe Abenu said. The Rebbe Shalom told them, no, everyone has to recognize that there's trailers. There are things in life that we don't know, we can't figure out on our own. And we have to consult a Rebbe. Everybody has to have a Rebbe. Korach said that we don't need a Rebbe. And even if a person's Rebbe passed away, you have to try to figure out what would your Rebbe, what would your Rebbe have said under these circumstances. Most of the Shilas that were presented to me in the last month the things that Rab Salabaychik spoke about. He didn't talk about it in a in the middle of a of a Shas Hatrak. There was no Magefa going on. But he spoke about these things on different occasions. So I just uh, he covered he covered all of these most of the topics were covered in Shia. He spoke about these things. I'm just saying over oh, what I heard from my Rebbe. Most of the things that I said, most of the Shurim that I say are things that I heard from my Rebbe. What was it like to be a Talmud in Rav Soloveitchik's shir? What was that like? I used to, the shir used to be just on Tuesday and Wednesday. Rav Soloveitchik came in Tuesday morning, and he gave a shir on Wednesday morning, and that was it. Then he went back uh, to Boston. Uh, but he <laughs> kept us just reviewing the shir and preparing for the next week's shir. Kept us busy a whole week long. He spoke very quickly. The shir was only two hours. But uh, he had so much to say. He spoke in Yiddish then. 
he switched to speak in English. It took him a long time till he figured out how to, how to speak English um, in a way that the students would understand. But originally, the she was in Yiddish, he used to speak very quickly. I remember there was a Tamachachan from Eretz Yisrael came and he visited the Shia, so he went back to Eretz Yisrael. So he said, the report was, he gives the Shia, boom, 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 boom. He kept on talking quickly, quickly. Had a lot to say. He's always very nuanced, very careful. He wouldn't exaggerate. Whenever you exaggerate to one direction or the other, all exaggerations are, sh are sheker. So they should, would always be very nuanced, try to figure out exactly what's the halacha. And uh, if you, it, it, there are a lot of people who, who l'shem shamayim, they want to exaggerate to their children. If, if, you, if you explain everything to the children, that there's ponem lakan, ponem lakan, and this is our tradition, that the children may decide to follow a different, uh, children may decide to follow a different tradition. So that's why a lot of religious Jews want to transmit their traditions to their children. So they tell them everything else is reform, everything else is conservative. This is the only way, this is the only approach. That's not true. We do believe in everything else is not reform and conservative. So that she was always very nuanced in giving the shear and in Han Hoge. We, uh, we used to come, I used to come to the shear all the time on Tuesday and Wednesday. We always dressed up like Shabbos Dick. The rest of the week, I, I dressed up uh, like a student. But for the Shia Tuesday, Wednesday, it was dressed up. Uh, we felt as if the angels came to hear the Shia, as if it was Ben Hashemayim. It was, it was extremely exciting. It was extremely exciting to listen to the Shia. And the, even though he tested. <laughs> I think, remember what? It only, would only cover, let's say, um, 35, 45 blot Gemara every year. In my time, in the later years, he was already old and he, he couldn't cover more. That was, but when he was healthy, it would cover much more ground. But uh, in the 45 blot that he would cover, <clears throat> he would discuss many other Gemaras, other Gemaras in different Mesichtas that came up that uh, that Tosis would refer to. So he covered more than, uh, than the 45 blot a year. He used to cover an awful lot. Nechama's uh, grandmother was married to Rabbi Pelkovitz, the Chornel of Racha. So Rabbi Pelkovitz once told me, even though he never learned in Wayu, he used to come to Wayu for the yard site shiur and for the big drushes. He said there were th a thousand people there. He said it was unbelievable. He said no one moved. How, what was that like being in the yard site shiur with so many people? Like, how, how was that? Yard site shiur once a year was so exciting that people wouldn't see each other since the year before. They would be walking in the street to the yeshiva from the bus station or from the train station. They would say, like, I fell on your side, like, I got the anthem. <laughs> like people came all dressed up. It was tremendous. And people sat glued to their seats for four hours. The yard side Russia was two hours aloha, then two hours agoda, two hours of agoda in Jewish on the topic on which the shir and halacha was. People came from, from out of town. People came from Europe. They used to, they were, Rab Salvechi used to give a shiit to Balabatim in Maria Synagogue in, uh, in Manhattan. That was a Broadway in the corner of 80th Street. Now it's a, now the, the building is no longer an office building. Now it's a, a shop, a store. But at that time, it was an office building. So the Balabatim rented one floor. And the businessmen who had to come into New York from out of town, those who knew about this year, would make sure that they would be in New York on Tuesday night. To come to the uh, to the Shira Maria. Shira Maria was also very exciting. So Veji used to prepare a lot for that Shia. He always prepared for all the Shira and the Yeshiva, but uh, the Shia for Balabatim that he prepared more, and the outside Yeshiva that was not correct. That was a work of art. Wow. It was unlike the regular Shia and the Yeshiva. He would start off by saying different Gemaras and asking murderous kashas. Then he would review all the kashas, four or five kashas. And you would think it's impossible. No one can figure out a teretz on these kashas. That would introduce you to another Gemara and say, see from that Gemara a certain idea. And he would show them that based on that idea, all the kashas fell apart. It was a, a work of art. It was really beautiful. People would sit in the, for many years, the Shia was in the base medrash because Rab Salavechik said his father used to give the Shia in the base medrash. It's your outside for his father. He wants to give the Shia in the base medrash. My father said he doesn't remember the Ramosh and Salavechik ever gave a shear. 
He said, he always gave it in the side room, the classroom, but he did anyway. Rav Zalesha didn't want to give the shir and lamp for the auditorium. He thought that was a secular room. But then the crowds were so big that they told they were not, not enough room for the people to sit in the base matters. The old base matters, not that big. People were standing in the hallway, standing outside in the street. But they had loudspeakers, but it wasn't right. So finally, after years, so they moved it to Lampert Auditorium. Whoever couldn't fit in Lampert Auditorium would sit in the base madrash. And it was still crowded. The base madrash was crowded and the hallways were crowded. So people would come 10 o'clock in the morning to reserve a seat and sit there all day long because they wanted to have a front seat. They wanted to hear well. They wanted to see everything. The year used to be uh, 8 o'clock in the evening. The people would come to get a good seat. They would come in the morning. They would bring the whole shots and be ready to listen to the it's very exciting. Wow. So for those of us who never had that experience, what was maybe a message that the Rav, a theme that he would come back to that we need to remember, we need to think about when we reflect on from the yard side from last week, a, an idea that he would want us to remember? He would tell over uh, Ms. Nagdish uh, joke about Chesidah Shireh. He would tell uh, on a K once in a while, he would say this. I heard it a few times from him that the Chesidish Rebbe was saying Torah by Shalashudis. How come in Parshas Lech Lecha, how come Lech Lecha is spelled with two big ches? So there was a Misnagat there. So the Misnagat said, What do you mean? First of all, it's not spelled with a ches, it's spelled with a chaf. And number two, it's a regular sized letter, it's not bigger than the other letters. So the Rebbe said, That's one teret, so I have a better teret. So they say, he would say this over to bring out the idea the best shot is the Pashab shot. So a lot of times he would give a shear and ask, he would throw out a question. And one of the students would uh, suggest the Teretz, a shot, how to answer everything. And it'd be all convoluted and complicated. So he said, what do you go so complicated? The, the easy shot is usually, Maruba the Ruba, the straightforward, simple shot is usually the correct shot. I remember Shmuel Soloveitchik, Rabbi Soloveitchik's uh, younger brother, used to teach chemistry in the yeshiva. So he said, that's a klal in science also. If there are two ways to explain a certain uh, scientific phenomenon, so usually the simple pshat is the correct one. The simple explanation, the convoluted one is usually not correct. So he told us that they really, for many years, they really never disproved the idea that uh, the sun goes around the earth except that uh, now that they send spaceships in order that everything should work, the, com the um, formula to explain how everything works is gonna be so long and so complicated. And if you assume that the earth goes around the sun, then uh, things are much easier. The, the formula is gonna be much shorter. You assume that the sun is going around the earth, the, the formula is gonna be very long and complicated. So in science also, that's the cloud. Whenever you have two ways to explain a phenomenon, the Pashib Shat is usually the more correct one or the correct one. So that's in learning. Rav Salvechik would always, he would ask, he would speak about Kashas in the Shia. Then he wouldn't give a Teretz. He would explain Pshat and the Gemara. So it turned out there wasn't a, there was no Kasha in the first place. Kasha was based on a misunderstanding. Not that's how they say from the Beis Alevi also. The Beis Alevi said, what's the difference between my son, Rav Chaim Salvechik, and myself? When someone asks me a kasha and I give a teretz, so he's happy and I'm happy. He's happy he has the good kasha and I'm happy I gave a good teretz. When my son, Rab Chaim Soloveitchik, gives a teretz, he always shows that the kasha was based on a misunderstanding. And uh, if you really, <laughs> really would have understood the Gemara, there wouldn't have been a kasha in the first place. So no one is happy. The one who asked the kasha realized that he misunderstood the Gemara. The one who gave a teretz didn't give a teretz. He just showed that there was no kasha in the first place. It was based on a misunderstanding. Most of the time, that's where Rav from where he would just give Pashib Shat and the Gemara. A lot of times he wouldn't even say what the difficulties are. He would just give Pshat and the Gemara. And some of the students were wondering, why did he say such a Pshat? Why didn't they give the Pshat the way we learned? Then after looking at the Mepharshim, we realized he was giving that Pshat to answer all the Kashas. Pashib Shat is uh, usually the simplest Pshat and the Gemara is usually the correct Pshat. Beautiful. Rebbe, thank you so much for the time. I know listening to the shiurim here in the Kolo, even when it's on the phone or on the Skype, or however, we so appreciate the shiurim that Rebbe gives us. And I also feel certainly the same way that when Rebbe finishes the shiur, we say, oh, it makes perfect sense. That's I should have figured it out on, his own, on our own in the first place. So Halavai will continue to go in that derech. The Rebbe should have gesund. Be well. Thank you so much for everything. First, Bifrat, for the Kolo, for all of Kal Yisrael.
Be well, Rabbi. Thank you. One should be healthy. Amen. Okay. Thank you so much, Rav Schechter. Our next guest, let me make sure this is still moving. Okay. Our next guest is an exceptional educator, author, blogger, a terrific personality. One second, let me just make sure this is working. Ah, oh, okay, great. So she'll be getting on in one second, and uh, that is Ruchi Koval. She is a, um, a director, together with her husband, Rabbi Sruli Koval, of the Jewish Family Experience in Cleveland, Ohio. She has an amazing blog, which I'm going to share here on the screen. Hold on, let me see if I can do this. There we go. Bingo, this is it. So this is the, the blog, Out of the Orthodox, Orthodox Judaism, Out of the Box. You can see it on the screen there. Um, she has a beautiful family that she's raising in Ohio. Good morning, Shalom Aleichem. I was just pulling up the, uh, the Orthodox. Hang on, we'll stop the share here. Um, she speaks in lots of different places all around uh, the world. She leads uh, groups of women and trips to Israel, the, the school, everything. And it's really awesome. Thank you so much for taking the time. It's great to see you. Thank you. Same here. All right. My last comment for full disclosure for those who are keeping track is that Ruchi is my first cousin. Her husband, Suli, and I are uh, our first cousins. And I still remember it's, I think, now over 25 years ago. I still remember your wedding. I think it's over 25 years now. Is that? Yep, it is. Okay. So um, they, they not only um, are family who we go to and visit in Cleveland when we have the opportunity, but also uh, when I was in Israel learning in Karen Yavne, so their apartment in Sanhedrin Marchevet was a regular spot for me to go for Shabbos meals and hanging out. And it's just, a, it's a special schuss and a treat to get back together. And my last comment before we get started this morning is the, the Mar Mokam that we have here on the screen is to Ruchi's book called Conversations with God, Prayers for, the, for Jewish Women. And it's here on the blog. You can find it. It also has a CD that goes with it. And I wanted to bring this to everybody's attention because now we're in this such a crazy uh, situation where people are embracing and connecting to tefillah in new ways. For those of us who are regular shul goers, so being at home is a very unusual experience. So now in our house, we have a shtibel in our basement. It it's, uh, has a name on it. It has tables. It has chairs. We had a Yisker appeal this week. We raised $240. Everybody <laughs> spoke. It was great. Um, you know, but, but what does that mean for our experience of tefillah on the inside? And how do we think about tefillah? And what are some things that we can do for women, but also for men, to not just survive davening at home, although I think there are some balabatim who say, we've been doing this for a long time, we're okay, don't tell us what to do. But for those of us who are shul goers, and hopefully sometime soon we'll all get back to that, and even those who weren't shul goers before will join the ranks, what are some things that when we're davening by ourselves or with our families that we can do to enhance our tefillah experience? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, obviously, I don't go to Minyan three times a day, but I, we do have our own shul, and I we go every single Shabbos, and I teach a Parsha class every week, and um, I really prefer to daven in shul as opposed to davening at home. I just appreciate being sort of buoyed by the pace and the mood of the shul, as opposed to, it, it's much harder for me on the weekday when I have to decide myself when to daven, um, and now that the locus of davening has shifted to the home, um, for me personally, it's been much easier because my husband is davening at home. We have like regular family times for davening. So it's like, you know, shul came to me. Um, and we sing a lot. We love to sing. And so we sing our way through davening. Um, but, you know, not everybody has that advantage and not everybody, some people are home alone. And, and for people who are used to davening three times a day and now have to do it at home, it's really hard. 
Um, I think davening at home has some definite, obviously, drawbacks, right? You can't take out the Torah, even though what we've done is my, my son got a little Torah for his third birthday for his upshare and for my grandmother. So now he just was bar mitzvah, so it's old, old. So we've been taking it out and davening around the house with it and bringing it over to the women's section and giving it a kiss. And, you know, so we're sort of simulating that, but obviously there's no Kaddish and there's no Kedusha and there's clearly so much missing. So definitely the drawbacks are there. However, I think that it's incumbent on us to focus on what are the advantages of not davening in shul. Well, a lot of people have trouble with davening in shul because no shul is going to be perfectly tailor-made to your needs, your pace, your tune, your relationship with Hashem. You know, people can get irritated with other people at shul. They go too fast. They go too slow. These people are talking. These people shush me when I'm talking. These people like Kiddush Club. These people hate Kiddush Club. Well, here's your opportunity to have a perfectly customized tefillah opportunity. For the first time in your life, the davening will be exactly the way you and only you want it. So in a way, like all of our excuses have been stripped away. You know, you want to sing your head off, do it. You like to daven faster, do it. You like to spend more time on Suke de Zimra, Shema. You want to focus a lot on Rafa Eno right now, do it. So I think we should view it as a golden opportunity to daven exactly the way we want to. And to remember that while Tefila de Tibor is obviously a huge, huge mitzvah and opportunity, but Tefila is really supposed to be a private conversation between you and Hashem. That's why I called my book Conversations with God. You know, and sometimes we sort of, we let the congregation carry us, but then we forget that it's really a boda shabalev. It's really our own service of the heart. So now all of that extraneous stuff has been taken away from us. And obviously it's our mitzvah right now. You know, it's not that we're being lenient on Tefillah B'Tibor, it's that we're being machmir on Ben Hashemar, Zem Ha'od L'Nav Shosechem. So this is exactly what Hashem wants us to do right now. This is exactly how Hashem wants us to daven right now. And it's our golden opportunity to figure out what really is our private relationship with Tefillah. Stripped away from all the other stuff, who's getting an honor, who gets Kadima with Kaddish, none of that stuff matters right now. What matters is you, Hashem, your way. It's a chance, it's an opportunity. Awesome. And so what are maybe some concrete examples? I know if you if <coughs> if you have a peek at the at the diary of the diary of the Piasets Nareba, Shemi Gamdamas Kusaglano, he gives you insights as to what it means to have a private conversation with Hashem. He actually formulates some tefillas, but that was written in the 1930s. And you know, so many books have been written in different contexts. But what are some ways that people can actually formulate their own tefillas? What are some guidelines for people to think about for themselves today? So it's interesting you asked that question. I did recently a webinar on, on Tila, and it was based on my book, and it was 10 sessions. One of the sessions was focused on this idea of private prayer, of um, personal prayer, meaning not within the sitter. And I talked about Tichinos and how Tichinos have always been a time-honored way to daven, where people, largely women also, wrote their own Tefilos in Yiddish or whatever was their, you know, lingua franca, wrote their own prayers to Hashem. However, they were often based on the structure of the tefillos in the sitter. So for example, um, to use that as an outline, like starting out mentioning schos avos, mentioning that we are the children of Abraham and Yitzchak and Yaakov. You know, when we bench lich, we mention Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, and Leah, that these are the people that Hashem, Hashem should be good to us because of these people. So that's the beginning. That's how we start out, right? That's how Shemona Esrei starts out. And then we go through our own personal requests. Very often the tefillos, drew on classical sources from the Torah, quoting Sukkim, from Tehillim, from Mishle, from Tanakh, to support what it is that we're asking for. And so that's, that's a great thing to do. Hashem, answer us the way you answered Sarah. Answer us the way you, remember us the way you remembered Noah. You know, heal us the way you healed Chizkiyahu. And then very often those Tehinos ended with So we end off by acknowledging that any tefila, anything that's, that's sort of limited to words is going to by definition be imperfect, but that Hashem who is all knowing sees what's in our heart and what's in our mind and knows what we really want to say and that Hashem has the generosity of spirit to listen even to the words that we didn't say. Maybe the words that we couldn't say, the words that we couldn't formulate or didn't know to ask for. 
you know, I think now with coronavirus, I think a lot of us are seeing that we didn't even really know what to daven for. Now it's become in such sharp focus, you know, how important our health is. And we all daven for health. We daven for it every single day, sometimes three times a day. But now we realize that, you know, for a healthy person to ask Hashem to keep us healthy, how, how poignant that is. So the Yehula Ratzon and Reisi is a way of saying, Hashem, you know better than me what I need. So even the things that I haven't articulated, please respond. So a person can use that sort of like outline, you know, start out with Tzchot Avos, talk about what's in your heart, try to draw on sources or Torah stories whenever you can, as though to draw a precedent. Hashem, you already do this, did this, so please do it again. And ending off with this request that Hashem recognize and acknowledge that our tefillos are imperfect. You know, any, the, the tefillos in the Siddur were obviously written by Anshay Knesset Hagdola. They were sages and prophets. They had all the passwords. They had all the keys. We don't have all the passwords and all the keys. But even if we just speak to Hashem in English, in our own words or in our own heart, and then we say to Hashem, you know what's in my mind, and please answer those tefillos. Um, just one more thing I want to say about the personal tefillah, and this is something that um, that truly taught me, my husband, your cousin, um, the idea that the gate. I think I saw him floating in the back of the kitchen. I, I don't know uh, if he's supervising he what you're saying over here, but I'm just saying. Kitchen. You want to wave to his cousin Ruby? Oh. <laughs> there he is. Bahava. <laughs> so, um, he, you know, we, we, we talk about the idea of, of crying with tears, that the gates of tears are never, are never locked. Um, you know, some people, stereotypically, more likely women, cry easily, particularly in tefillah. Um, but what truly taught me was that even if you can't bring your prayer to tears, maybe you can bring your tears to prayer. So if you find yourself getting choked up or teary-eyed, even if it's because you're overtired or you slammed a finger in the door or your kid just threw up all over your floor, whatever the case may be, or if you're the kind of person who finds it hard to cry, but you feel that gut-wrenching internal feeling, Try to take that moment, that's a golden opportunity, and turn it into tefillah and say, you know what, Hashem, this is a really intense emotion that I'm having right now, and I don't want to squander it. Tears are like the sweat of the soul, right? When your body works out, you sweat, and when your soul works out, your soul sweats. So tears, you know, we apologize for tears in our society. If somebody cries, we're like, I'm sorry, you know. The Torah is full of stories of grown men crying and not apologizing. It means right. that your neshama is having a workout. So use that moment to dive in and say, okay, Hashem, I'm crying right now. Please, you know, if it's just keep my family healthy or cure the world of this virus or help me to regain my footing in this difficult time or help this person, that person that I love or help me to overcome my stress, my anxiety, whatever it might be. So that's another really great way to create spontaneous prayer out of a moment of strong emotion. And part of maybe what you're saying then is just the opportunity to enhance our awareness of the presence of Hashem on an ongoing basis. And so that tefillah is at fixed times, but it's all the time because the more we are conscious of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the Dalaf Neimiyat to Omid, so to speak, like that Hashem awareness all the time, so we can express it in different ways, and that also fits with, with the notion of tefillah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, and I, I think of some of our grandmothers who didn't have a who didn't necessarily daven from the sitter, but they were talking to Hashem all the time, you know, and it's just, they, they were role models for us. That's, that's really what our lives should be is an ongoing conversation with Hashem, you know. Beautiful. Thank you as always for the time. Great to see you. Great to see Strilly. Stay you. well, Thank keep you. healthy. I hope uh, everybody gets back to normal very soon and uh, you'll be able to continue the amazing, amazing work that you are doing. Uh, look forward to seeing you here again soon in Chicago. Thank you for the time, of course. Take care. Have a great day. Thank you again to Ruchi. It's, a, it's an amazing opportunity for me and for our Kolol to be able to bring together so many different places from different vantage points and different special guests. And we are now privileged to welcome let me make sure this is working. Yes. Rabbi Schachter, Rebetzi, can you see me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you and see you. Ah, oh, amazing. Beautiful. So amazing. So special to see you. I will say, Rabbi Schachter, 
Baruch Hashem, one of the main gifts of this whole tekufa is that I'm living on Zoom. Everything is one Zoom to the next. Although when I want to get a change of scenery, I move to Google Hangouts and it's like going to the park, which is great. The problem is, is that those of us who are Baruch Hashem from Eastern European roots, the only thing you see on the Zoom is my nose. I don't think there's anything else you could see on the screen. So at least you know that it's me. You see the nose, you recognize it. Uh, for those who do not know, Rabbi Schachter is a senior scholar at Yeshiva University Center for the Jewish Future. But the truth is, is that he has been a personal mentor of mine. He, unfortunately for him, accidentally, as an act of chesed, over 15 years ago, went, walked into a shir that I happened to be giving. And what did I know? I was a little shmendrick. You know, I'm sitting there talking. Rabbi Schachter is sitting there. And uh, he came into my shir. And the unfortunate consequence for him was that I pursued that shir afterwards to, for him to help me with drushes and shiurim and so many things, even on an ongoing basis, to have him as a mentor and as a support and as a cheerleader and as a critic. My first drushes in Fairlawn got thrown well out the window very quickly when I sent them to him. And uh, Rebetzin, not just in your professional role with the clients that you help, but also in the role that the Rebetzin has played with many Rebetzins and other students who have looked to you to be mechazek them. It's such an awesome covered and a joy to welcome you back to Chicago as a team. Thank you. It's our pleasure, uh, Rabbi Brand. We, when we see you, we see not only your face, but we see the Hadras Panim, and we see everything behind it, and we recognize and acknowledge and appreciate the incredible, incredible gift that you are to your community. And we know very well all that you do and continue to do. And we're all blessed uh, to be able to know you and to be able to benefit from you. That's and so kind. enthusiasm is contagious. And if there's anything that we know that we need now is upbeat enthusiasm. Yes, yes, absolutely. And I know, especially today, with the passing of Rebbitz and Lamb, it's a very difficult time for so many, especially in the Jewish Center family. So it's such a strange, last week we had Dr. Pelkovitz on. So we were talking about the strange dialectic of, on the one hand, feeling the tsar of the people who are Nebuch really going through such a difficult time physically, emotionally, financially, and at the other time, trying to keep people upbeat and some chizuk and a little bit of just, you know, so maybe Rabbi Shachter, we could start with you for a little bit, because for those who don't know, Rabbi Shachter, he was for many years, and that's why I mentioned uh, Rabbi Zalam Allah Shalom, he was for many years a practicing rabbi of a congregation at the Jewish Center, one of the most prominent, prominent congregations in New York City. And now for the past many years, I think probably almost 15 years, maybe more, has been a mentor of congregational rabbis across the country and even beyond outside the United States. They have cohorts where they get together and Rabbi Shachter provides Chomel Adrush and sometimes a shoulder to cry on and Chizuk and Hadracha. So I thought it would be important maybe for you to share a little bit with people what they should know about rabbis during this time because people are looking to their rabbis to be a lot of things for them. And the rabbis themselves are challenged and struggling. And, and how is it that people should think about their rabbis as they go through this un unprecedented period? Um, I appreciate the question very much. Um, I know that uh, rabbis are playing a very important role, but to be able to open up a window a little bit into their personal lives and into their professional lives uh, in the presence of uh, so many people who are watching and who are interested in hearing, uh, I think is a wonderful opportunity. Um, my experience has been extremely intense uh, with uh, the rabbis over the course of the last number of weeks. Uh, it's, as you mentioned, something I spend a lot of time on in general, but uh, somehow uh, recently it's become extremely, extremely uh, powerful and uh, very, very, very important. My respect for Rabbanim uh, including those in your community and uh, outside, uh, has grown uh, enormously, enormously. I've always had great respect. I've considered them sort of a Talmud Chaver, Talmidim Chaverim of mine. But uh, the, the level of commitment, the level of care, the level of engagement, the level of seriousness, um, the amount of work is, is extraordinary. Uh, I think rabbis now, in a way, it sounds a little bit unusual, are working harder than ever before because they're juggling so much. I mean, I could uh, list a whole range of shilas 
that rabbis had to deal with absolutely unprecedented, whether uh, pre-Pesach Shilas, during Pesach Shilas, uh, post-Pesach Shilas. Um, and uh, these are issues that uh, are very central to them, that their Balabatim were looking for them for guidance. Um, and here I do want to mention, uh, I know that you had Rav Shechter on earlier, um, the level of heroism that he has uh, demonstrated and uh, the level of, of wisdom, and kindness and, and sensitivity and just awesome firepower has been uh, outstanding. Uh, our entire community have been standing on, on his shoulders and uh, it's just incredibly important. I believe that you expressed Hakar's Hatov to him for this at the outset of this program, but I want to underscore that. Um, Thank you, so it's interesting. Just, to, I'll, yes, and it was interesting to, to me that last week we had Rabbi Berman on, and he also said that from his perspective as the president of YU, he thought that the Rashi Yeshiva Bechlal and Rav Shechter Bifrat have done so much to shoulder the responsibility of making these decisions to close shuls, to close Bate Medrash. That's, so thank you. Yes, and. Yes, it's true. And I would also add Rabbi Willig because. Yes, he, Rabbi Willig also, for sure. Uh, of, of all of the Rashi Yeshiva have played a primary role in this particular area as being, as being poskim, but uh, Rabbi Shechter uh, in, in particular. So rabbis are dealing with serious questions and they're also emotionally related questions. Like what are we gonna do about Yisker? Um, what am I gonna do about Kaddish? Uh, I'm in Avel, I have your side. Um, issues that are not technically halachic only but also uh, reflect a deep uh, emotional concern that the rabbis need to be involved in. Um, I would also say that rabbis heroically have spent an enormous amount of time just reaching out to Balabat. I know rabbis over the course of the last number of weeks who've made, and I'm not exaggerating, hundreds of phone calls, okay. touching base not only with the uh, ones who are individuals, not only with the, those who are living alone, whether they're older or young singles who, who also are living alone, uh, but to couples just to check in, how you doing, what's going on? And, and, and it's, it's, it's draining, it's emotionally draining and it's very time consuming. And uh, I have an incredible amount of respect for them. And I think all of those listening here should appreciate the, the great, great dedication and devotion uh, without exception that their rabbis are uh, demonstrating for them during this extremely difficult time. It's beautiful, it's amazing. And again, thank you to you because for us, you're that, you know, that go-to person, that person that we can lean on when we need that chizuk. So maybe we could turn to the Rebetzin a little bit from a mental health standpoint. What is it that you're seeing and that you can advise for, the, for us, for the regular folks, how to navigate what now is becoming even more challenging. I know in Illinois, we were informed on Friday by our governor that school is done, that's it, gamarnu. So now a lot of parents who are home, Baruch Hashem, we have five children living in this house, but we have several, one adolescent and four children. So I don't know how you cheshven that, but you know, we have five children in this house. You know, now we're looking at another seven weeks or eight weeks, whatever it's going to be, where everybody's in the house, whether they're on Zoom or they need help. Or they, so it's a lot, a lot of time. I don't know what it's like in New Jersey if they said anything about school, but we're done. We're done. So how do you advise for families, whether it's for families who are in very close quarters, and then you have the opposite. You have people who are home alone and they're, they're not having any interaction. I'm glad that you mentioned the range of people because obviously this pandemic affects us all differently from people who are alone because they're younger and alone and not attached to anybody or they're older and either they were never partnered or they've lost their partner in their lives or people who like yourself have children who range the age from teenagers all the way down to much younger. This is not a one size fits all. But given that reality, I will try to just repeat because it's really so critical, some of the things that you have heard dozens of times and which will help you herald through the next many weeks. Keeping a schedule, whether you are alone or whether you're with seven other people in your household, having a schedule really helps. And if you're in the beneficial 
um, situation where you have others living with you, whether it's one other or five others, sit down together to make sure that you are very clear about what you're going to expect. The next thing is that those who know me know I'm a big advocate for self-awareness and self-care. One of the other things that is clearly not one size fits all is who people are and what they need. So even one family of five and another family of five may be completely different profiles and have different needs. Know what your needs are. Know what it is that you personally need and what your families need. In some cases, the schools are really very, very proactive. I don't know what it's like in Chicago, but people are very much looking towards their schools for certain kinds of scheduling. And that will take about an hour or two, or if you're lucky, a little bit more per day. And then you're looking for other things to do. The important thing is to strike a middle ground between serious and fun. We are bombarded every day, Nebuch with losses and fear. And we have to not pretend that this is terrible. We have to understand that our children know it and that we know it, but that they also pick up how we handle it. And in the months and years ahead, it's going to be how we handle it that our children are gonna remember. So to that end, the adults in the family must try to figure out how they are going to do their self-care. Now it may come in sound bites or it may come in a little bit of a longer stretch. The partners and the families have to figure out what they need and how they're going to get it. And if it's a five minute walk in the morning or if it's listening to a Torah lecture for 30 minutes or if it's picking up the phone and reaching out to your family or friend, you have to be fueled before you could fuel the others. And especially for the rabbinic families and for those of you in the audience who are caretakers, whether you're in the medical profession or any kind of caretaking profession. And frankly, if you're in a family or in a caretaking profession, one needs to be aware that unless you self-care, you will not be able to give to other people in a successful way. I could go on and on, but I want no, to- No, that's good. It's something Rabbi Schachter knows I'm terrible at. So I'm glad you reiterated that because it's uh, one of my many, many shortcomings. All right, a couple minutes we have. Um, I had mentioned, I thought it would be interesting to hear from the two of you if you have some book recommendations. Now I have a book to recommend, but not everybody can get this book. How about this book right here, okay? This uh -huh. is called, His Mother Didn't Call Him Our Beloved Teacher, a collection of sermons inspired by Rabbi Dr. Jacob J. Schachter Shlita. So those of us who have ever given a decent drasha that Rabbi Schachter has taught to do with the H, I don't know if I should give that away in, in live television here. It could be, we, we, all right, we have to edit that out somehow. This is the problem when you do live, it's all out there. That's it. It's our following. Uh, fine. It's okay. <laughs> so not everybody has, first of all, not everybody has a great library. Some of the resources, I know the Skokie Public Library has resources available online. Um, Nechama Bar Hashem, she was a shtickle nevia. So the day before they put everything on lockdown, she ran to the library. She got a stack of books that goes from like here to up here. So all the kids have something to read. She has something to read. And Bar Hashem, I have plenty. But what about for people who are out there who maybe they have a small library, they don't have so much a small library. What can people, because a lot of people, uh, they're looking for something to read, something to do to, to help give, fill that schedule, that time. Any good book recommendations that you've enjoyed? Um, I, I think that's also a very personal kind of preference, but what has worked in Teaneck, I don't know if Chicago has something like a Jewish um, WhatsApp group. We have Teaneck Shuls. Okay, they have here uh, Skokie Shuls. Here. Shuls all the time, leaving a stack of books outside for your perusal. Really? And people just look at other people's books. You don't know necessarily what somebody else is going to like. And one thing I want to caution against is some people think that they want to be inspired and read Holocaust novels or people who <laughs> overcame terrible odds. And it is okay. inspiring and resilience is the key here. We're going to be resilient. The human condition is resilience. But try, even as we celebrate, as we commemorate Yom HaShoah, remember that this is a different kind of experience. Take the um, inspiration, 
but be careful not to immerse yourself in just very serious kinds of books. So you want to have a balance of inspirational books religiously, inspirational books survival-wise, and also humor and mindless kinds of books. Somebody, a, a neurosurgeon who we know who was drafted to COVID after he was practicing neurosurgery for a while, bought himself a coloring book because that's what is called for to balance out the seriousness. So for everyone, it's different. Yeah, Rabbi Shakta, maybe you could pick up on that just before on the books, this interesting thing, because I noticed that online, that there were some people who are drawing kind of parallels and issue in Yonim having to do with Yom HaShoah. I felt like that was a little bit strange and out of place. We're in a pandemic, but it's not, I, to me, it doesn't seem like that is, it, it's not the same Indian to me. So I, I, I'll speak to that briefly, and then I want to have a concluding remark. I, yeah. I'll leave the uh, to your Okay. Um, I regretfully have not had time uh, to, to just um, read. I'm uh, Bar Hashem blessed with a number of projects that I'm working on and using whatever free time I have, which doesn't exist, to try to move forward with them. Um, but I, I do want to say that, uh, I, and I'm going to use a strong word, and I'm going to say I'm offended. I'm offended by people who are paralleling. Lahavdil Elef Alfe Havdolos Veribe Revavos are paralleling these two experiences. Uh, yes, we're frightened. Yes, we're concerned. Yes, we're afraid. Yes, we, uh, we, we don't know. Uh, the future is uncertain. But it is eno dome bichlal, the situation now to then. Um, many of us are surrounded by families. Even if we're alone, we have connections. We pick up the phone. We have a Zoom. We have relationships. People knock on our door. We have food. I mean, it's, it, it is ludicrous. Um, I do understand the desire, as Yocheved mentioned, to seek um, inspiration from times of adversity, but that's it. Um, I, I, I think it's highly inappropriate and it trivializes the, the Shoah as we're going into the Shoah, to Yom HaShoah tomorrow night, to even begin to think that there's even a Shemitz of a Havamina, of, of a shtickle of an anything, of a kind of, a, of an ultimate parallel between the two. I would also add just uh, as you're taking a breath, because of Yitzker this week, to mention the memory of your father, Zechit Tzadok Levracha, Nishmaso Eden, who would, I'm sure he would have a lot to say about that Indian. So I appreciate, have an aliyah. I appreciate it very much. And, and Dafka, uh, this uh, April 11th, uh, is the 75th anniversary, mamish to the day that my father, Zechron Levracha, liberated the Buchenwald concentration camp. So we've been thinking about him a lot. And that's the segue to my final comments. I know our time is brief. I want to be brief. Um, I gave a Yortzai cheer in memory of my father who was uh, the Sunday night before Yom Tiv, And I shared a thought at the end that I would like to share now that has been very much uh, resonating with me. In the, in the fourth uh, parak in Malachim Beis, uh, the Pasuk tells us, and it's the Haftorah for Pashas Vayera, about the uh, Isha Achas who was uh, crying to Elisha and uh, saying that she doesn't have a husband anymore. And now the creditor has come to take her two sons away, La'avadim. And she's bereft and she's lost and she's going to be alone and she doesn't know what to do. And she's facing a crisis and she's facing uncertainty and she's frightened. And, and <laughs> the response is what I want to highlight. Bayomer Eleha Elisha, Perek Dalid, Pasig Beis, Malachim Beis, Mo Eeselach, what can I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? And she responds that I have in the house some oil. He says, okay, take the oil and then the oil will become more oil. And then you'll have a plethora of oil. You'll be able to sell the oil and you'll be able to pay off the debt and your sons will be safe with you. But notice the question. Notice what he does not ask. He does not ask, do you have anything in the house? He asks, what? do you have in that? Because he knows that there's something in the house. The only question is, what is in the house? We're facing really difficult times and there are families who are really struggling and we are deeply involved uh, with them and care very much about them. There is something in the house, each one of us, as we face this difficult time, it's not like, oh my God, what do I have? No, I have something. The avoda is, let's, let's find what we have to be able to gather strength 
to face the fright, the fear, the anxiety, the unknown, the tension, the nervousness, and the future. Not yesh lecha babayis, ma yesh lecha babayis. We have it in the house. We have it differently, but we have it. Let's be confident that it's somewhere. Let's dig in deep and find it and work on it and be able to extra and for it to serve for us as strength to get us through this difficult time. Oh, amen. Thank you so much for inviting us. Thank you for the time. Thank you. It's so it's such chizik just to see both of you. It's great. And you didn't have to leave the house. You didn't have to get on a plane. You didn't have to sleep in some hotel somewhere. You get to stay at home and we get to see you. So that's an upside at least. Be I well. Just, be I distant. just share that the ref as a compliment to what you just said, everybody has what we need in our house, the resilience, we think we can't do it. But to compliment that, and I think this is an example of it, reach out to people. We are so fortunate that the refua came before the maka. Technology is here and we need to use it. And whether it's reaching out to friends or family by phone or by technology, let's keep this going and we'll get through it. Amen. Thank you so much. Be gesund. Nachas from the kids. Everybody should be well. You Take care. Be well. Be well. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye-bye. Here, I'll show you. Uh, our final guest this morning is a neighbor. I guess I could, I could probably could hit your house with a baseball if I threw it hard enough. We are very excited and great, grateful to welcome Dr. Ben Katz. Doc, can you hear me? I don't hear you yet. Now I see you. Let me, can I hear you? Not yet. Hang on. A little bit Zoom challenge. Right. No, no, you're good. I hear you and see you now. But now I dialed it. I dialed in separately. I couldn't do it both on the computer for some reason. No worries. Okay. So first of all, for those who do not know, Dr. Ben Katz lives right here in Skokie. He's an infectious disease doctor at Lurie Children's. And he has been, I would say, intimately involved over the last six weeks, I guess we would say, in the, in the decisions and advising various rabbis and community members about... Um, how to handle from a from a community standpoint how to handle the um, the COVID crisis. So maybe the first place to start, Doctor, is to to maybe give us a little bit of an insight as to what it was like for you as a physician to play a role advising and informing rabbis as to how to make that make that call as to when we should close schools and schools. I know that oh we lost your audio because you you got to call in to use the audio or turn on the audio in the computer. But I would say that uh, you, you were also helpful, even just from a COLA standpoint, in navigating how our programs would be shaped, what would be in person, when we would go online. So I think it would be interesting for people to hear. The other thing that while you're uh, joining on the phone, I'm going to pull up the slides that you sent so people can see it. One second. We're getting this technology right. Here we go. Let's see. Okay. So here we go. All right, so the, uh, the slides are up now. Do you have your audio? Let's see if you can call in. Not yet, your audio is not up yet. Hold on. Hold on one second, we can't hear you yet. Okay. Let's see, hang on. Let's see. Let's give you a minute there. Okay, one second, it's not up yet. Let's see.
Okay, one second. I'm getting a note here on the text. They're working on the technology. Okay, still can't hear you yet. Hang on. Hang on, last call. We had you before when you were also in on the phone because you could add by the phone. So if you want, you can go back to the phone. Is there a way? All right, in the middle while Dr. Katz is getting it squared away, you can't find the call in number easily. Okay, uh, while he's getting it squared away, we'll share one Dvar Torah, one, one Ha'ar in this week's parasha, parashas Tazriah. So the end of the parasha, we are introduced to the mitzvah of brismila, and this is part of a much larger arc in thinking about the number eight. At the night of the Seder, when we asked, Echad mi odea, so when we said, Shmona mi odea, Shmona yemei mila. So the mila, that represents something which is me'al hateva, Kodesh Baruch Hu, God gave us a natural world, a physical confines in which we exist, and that enables us to bring HaKadosh Baruch Hu out in this world. This world has seven dimensions. So that's why, so to speak, HaKadosh Baruch Hu created the world in seven days with seven musical notes and seven colors in the rainbow. So the number seven represents the fullness of this world. The days of Pesach, seven days of Pesach, seven days of Sukkot. But the eighth note, the eighth day, the eighth dimension, that's something that's purely on a spiritual level. So that's why the additional element, the Torah, which is going to be added to our experience of Pesach is going to be on the eighth day. The, it's the added component that we have. It's going to be Shemini Atzeres, so to speak, and that's going to be after seven weeks of seven, that's going to be Shavuos, the same way that after Sukkot we have an eighth day. So it happens to be in Chutzlar, we have eight days of Pesach, but really we only should have seven days of Pesach like they have in Israel, and the eighth day is that Atzeres, is that additional level, and that's what we have uh, on a physical level as well, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave us a goof, gave us a physical body, and with that, oh, now I see her popping up, and with that physical body, um, I think I hear you now. Are you there? Not yet. I don't hear you. I see the phone is there, but I don't hear you yet. So on the eighth day, you want to raise the volume just so we can hear you? On the eighth Hello? day, oh, perfect. Let's just finish this. Vart, Doc, you're back. So on the eighth sure. day, we add this me'ala teva, this eighth dimension, which adds a pure ruchnius element. Yes, the guf has all the different 365 limbs and 248 sinews, and each of those is used in our avodah Hashem is connects to something higher, but ultimately it's this, uh, the added dimension of the neshama, which is the spiritual component that we have that adds to us uh, with the bris mila. Okay, so now... With that snafu cleared away, Dr. Ben Sion, you're there. Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear Perfect. me? Yes, now we hear you. Let's let's hear okay, it. Okay, so, great. So tell us a little bit about just the narrative that it was to, to get this going and what it was like working with the rabbis. So actually, um, it's been a, um, I think it's been an interesting experience for me as well as I hope for the, uh, for the rabbis as well. Um, you know, obviously, this is my area of expertise, although it's very hard to um, to know exactly what the right decisions are. I'm sure rabbis are confronted with these kind of dilemmas all day, just like doctors are. But it was it was kind of interesting to kind of go over what's known, what's not what's not known, what the best um, kind of recommendations to make. Right? Because, you know, public health is, is public health is kind of tricky. 
You, you need to be able to make recommendations that will benefit most people by inconveniencing the least number of people. And it's often based on imperfect data. And that's why some of these decisions can change as the data, you know, you know becomes better or more um, robust. Um, but I, I think I found an interesting experience. I've never had so many rabbis on my speed dial before. <laughs> um, but I think it's been, um, I think it's been an interesting experience. You know, there's a Chinese curse. May you live in interesting times. So there's some advantages, and disadvantages to having interesting times, but it's been an interesting learning experience, I think. And obviously I'm hoping that it's an educational on both, le- on both, on both, you know, on both sides. Yes. Fascinating. So I'm on the slides now. I skipped ahead to the, yeah, let's go back to-, to the second one, please. Yes. Just go back, back to the second one, one right after the title one? slide. Yeah. One more, one more back. Yeah, please. You see it? Okay, so I can just talk for a few minutes just to give a little bit of a background and, and, and to kind of take you where it's known and where it's not known. And then if people have questions, I'm, I'm happy to try to answer them if, that, if that's okay. Sure. I, nobody's going to be able through this medium, nobody's going to be able to ask questions. So I'll reflect back. Oh, oh okay, fine. Go for it. So I'll just talk. Okay, yeah. so basically, there are seven known human coronaviruses. There are many coronaviruses that infect other vertebrate species, but there's only seven that are known to affect humans. Um, four cause mild disease, just basically common colds. Three are more serious, of course, and um, the, the, the newest one, we only found out about, unfortunately, the end of December, early January. So everyone probably knows about SARS and MERS. So SARS arose in the early 2000s, MERS about 10 or 15 years later. Um, SARS probably also came out of these Chinese live markets. MERS came out of somewhere in the Middle East. And these diseases had had high mortalities, um, but were not that transmissible, so were more easily contained with traditional kind of quarantine methods. The virus, the infection that we have now has two names. The virus is called SARS um, coronavirus 2 or SARS-CoV-2 because it's most similar to the SARS coronavirus of the other six known human coronaviruses. The disease is called coronavirus um, um, 2019. So the disease is called COVID-19. The virus is called SARS-CoV-2. Most people just say COVID. So that's probably what I'll say for the rest of these uh, few minutes that I'm going to speak. Um, and they all have emerged from animals for reasons that are not that clear. If you can go to the next slide, please, Rabbi. Yes. Got it. So um, I said some of this a little bit already. So the epidemiology of COVID is that it's, it's less deadly than SARS, but it's more easily transmissible because it can be transmitted at least 48 hours before symptoms begin. So it's kind of like watch me and get off a stop before I do. You can't quarantine people if you don't know if they're sick or not. And of course, you know, we haven't been testing enough people and it's not clear how good the tests are before you're symptomatic. So it's been much trickier to quarantine people for this disease than it's been for SARS, unfortunately. Now compared to the, an average flu season, and again, I'm not belittling anything or making light of anything, but the numbers now, the number of deaths we've seen in the United States is about equivalent to an average flu season. The trouble is that the percent of people dying that we know of seems to be about 10 times higher. Mm-hmm. Now, some of this could be because we're not testing enough people. Um, we know, for example, that probably 4% of kids um, are, are walking around and are asymptomatically shedding this virus. So if there's more people who are positive, then the denominator increases and the number of deaths will go down. But for now, the death rate is, is, is uncomfortably high, which is part of the reason why we're taking unusual precautions, which we didn't do, for example, 10 years ago with pandemic flu. Now, fortunately, most cases of coronavirus are mild. Um, Only about 5% end up in the ICU. Um, As you all know, mortality increases with age. Um, It's about 15% if you're over 80, 8% if you're over 70. Um, So, you know, again, the the older you are and if you have certain compromising conditions, the worse it'll be. Very, very few cases are under age 19. Now, it could be that there are more asymptomatic cases and we're not testing them, but at least symptomatic cases, there are very, very few. Kids under 19 are a very small percentage of hospitalizations and, and, and really a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of deaths. There's been maybe one or two kids under 19 dying, I think, in all of the United States so far. So it's really pretty rare. Babies under a year of age are more likely to be symptomatic and hospitalized. But again, thankfully, the mortality is still quite low, even under a year of age. And one thing we know about the virus is the epidemiology in terms of the incubation period. So um, the average incubation period is five days. 
by 12 days after an exposure, 95% of people faded to become infected will become infected. And by day 14, that number goes to 99%. So that's why you're hearing about the two week as the, um, as, as the upper limit for an incubation period. That's why quarantines have basically been two weeks. Uh, next slide, please, Rabbi. Got it. So, um, in general, and again, the, the, the knowledge base here is a lot empiric. In order to stop transmission, there's a couple things you need to do. One thing you need to do is to usually you need to stop it for at least two incubation periods for disease to go away. So that's why all of the initial um, um, like stay at home and all those kinds of orders were usually not 14, but 28 days. And they may need to be extended, but that's usually why it's been about 28 days. The other thing you need to do is they keep, epidemiologists keep track of a number called R, which is how many people the average infected person is infecting. And you don't have to be a big genius to figure this out. If I'm infecting more than one person, then the, the, the epidemic is increasing. If I'm an infected person and I infect less than one new person, then the, the epidemic is going away. It, and now, Part of the problem is it's hard to figure out what R is. For, for this disease, it's probably somewhere between two and three. And with the distancing measures we've been having now, even in New York, it seems to be less than one right now, like 0.9. In Germany, for example, it's 0.7. So these are the kinds of trends that people want to see before they start to even want to think about reopening you know, a society. Yeah. Um, like I said already, for SARS, this, this, this distancing works better because only symptomatic people transmitted the disease. Um, and it seems unlikely, just to let everybody know, that schools are going to be reopening this year. Uh, and yesterday's New York Times, they talked about in Denmark, they try, they're starting to reopen some schools. But again, the kids are washing their hands when they come in. They're washing their yeah, hands so. every hour. <laughs> they're staying six feet away. It's tricky, but they're trying to reopen some schools. I don't think it's going to happen in the United States. I know Northwestern, I'm pretty sure, is going to stay closed the whole quarter. They canceled graduation. Um, yeah, so the day schools, according to... Uh, what we heard on Friday, Governor Pritzker closed all of the schools in Illinois for the duration of the term. So we got word that. Yeah, that, that, sounds, that sounds right. Yeah. And again, um, so and, you know, even all the social distancing stuff, you know, the, the, the data that it's based on are, you know, this isn't rocket science and this isn't these aren't really controlled trials. The best data come from, believe it or not, the so-called Spanish flu from 100 years ago. You know, by the way, it had nothing to do with Spain. It's called the Spanish flu. <laughs> Because um, Spain was a new, you know, the, the, in World War One, it was probably coming from Germany. But because we were sending troops there, we didn't want to scare people. So, so all the allies weren't reporting on the flu. Spain was a neutral country, so Spain reported on the flu. So it's called the Spanish flu. But anyway. Um, in this, a hundred years ago, there was no CDC. So basically, every state and every municipality did what they thought was best. So there were like fifty different controlled experiments, and the data aren't perfect. But the the states that implemented early and several different social distancing techniques seemed to do better than states that didn't. They had about half the mortality. So that's where some of these data come from. They also, everyone's always quoting a famous example of um, St. Louis and Pittsburgh. They both have had big parades scheduled, I think, for St. Patrick's Day. St. Louis canceled theirs. Pittsburgh did not. And St. Louis had twice the mortality following the parade of Spanish flu than Pittsburgh did. So those are the kinds of data that we talk about with social distancing. Um, so this slide talks about masks. I just wanted I to clarify so the business with masks a little bit because everyone wants to know about masks. So masks outside of a hospital setting don't really seem to prevent you from getting an infection from somebody else. So when there weren't enough masks, there was no recommendation to wear masks. Now that there's enough masks, and now that we know that asymptomatic people can transmit the disease, the reason to wear a mask is not to prevent you from getting infected. It's to prevent you, if you're asymptomatic, from giving it to you somebody, somebody else. else. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, my father, all of a sudden, used to always say it's hard to make predictions, especially about the future. You know, you read in <laughs> history books, so, you know, Churchill obviously had to do this. Churchill didn't obviously have to do anything. He did the best he could at the time. And, uh, and you know, if he did the right thing, it was the right thing. If he didn't do the right thing, it wasn't the right thing. So it's very hard to know what's going to happen in the future. But that being said, we're going to probably start 
opening up society, probably, my guess would be sometime in mid to late May. My guess will be, and I could be wrong about this, that by Shavuot, I think that some shuls might be open, at least again in some fashion. I could be wrong, of course. But cases are going to start to increase again, but hopefully not by too much. And, 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 and you you see, people don't always get this. First of all, we'll have some more data on treatment. So all this stuff that people talk about, hopefully we'll have some, you know, there's no real data now on what works because it's all compassionate case use. There's no controls. Hopefully in a month or two, there'll be some better data on to how to actually treat this. But the other thing that people don't realize is that even if the same number of people get sick, but over an extended period of time, at least the healthcare system can deal with that. Right. You don't want to have a situation where there's not enough, like in today's New York Times talking about dialysis machines, or there's not enough ventilators. That was, even if the same number of people get infected, as long as it's slower, then we can deal with them. They can go into the hospital, they can get a ventilator, and they can get better, God willing. Mm-hmm. Um, also, as time goes on, we'll know, even though we're still not testing enough people, you know, Germany is testing over 100,000 people a day, oh, and wow. they have a population of like 80 million people. So in three months, they can theoretically test everybody. We're nowhere near that. But hopefully we'll be testing more people, we'll know yeah. more who are infected, and we'll know more about who's immune. And now again, uh, yeah. and just the last slide is about a vaccine. So, you know, the influenza vaccine changes every year. All they have to do is tweak it. And it still takes six to eight months to become available. So with something that's new, it's very hard to believe there's going to be a vaccine in less than a year, year and a half. So I'm not trying to be a pessimist here. And I tend to be optimistic in general. But there's, there's no way you're going to get a vaccine in less than a year. Got seems it. to me. Fascinating. Okay, well, this was uh, certainly for me incredibly educational. I'll stay in touch, Mir Tzashem, as things develop in terms of the kolal at some point going back in person. Thank you so much sure. for the time. And uh, Mir Tzashem, we should connect in, in person for simchas over happy occasions without this. Be well, Amen. thank you. Always great to see you. And, no uh, problem, just Rabbi. Virtually. Happy to do it. Thanks so much. All right, I just want to thank again everybody for participating. I want to thank Rav Schechter Shalita, I want to thank Mrs. Koval. I want to thank the Schachters. I want to thank Dr. Katz. Thank, of course, all of you for joining me this morning. We learned a lot. We learned about the importance of having a Rebbe, of taking the opportunity to personalize our davening, to take care of ourselves and to appreciate our rabbis and to be aware of what's going on out there. And for this week, Amir Tzashem, you'll be seeing some emails. The Kolo has some wonderful online learning opportunities, both Shiurim, the Yom HaShoah event, as well as lots of other exciting things going on in terms of our spiritual growth. So thanks for coming. Welcome, uh, as always, to our living room. And I look forward to seeing you soon. Take care. Have a, have a good week. Be well. Bye-bye. Bye.